Saint Barbara, for she has broken the snares of the enemy, and like a sparrow she, the all-modest maiden, was delivered out of them by the help and weapon of the cross. Guide of orthodoxy, teacher of piety, and holiness, luminary of the world, God-inspired adornment of monastics. O wise John, by thy teachings thou hast enlightened all, O harp of the Spirit, intercede with Christ God that our souls be saved. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. We thank you, O merciful Master, benefactor of our souls, that you have this day made us worthy to give, to give us your heavenly and immortal mysteries. Direct us into the right way. Strengthen all of us in your fear. Watch over our life. Make sure our endeavors through the prayers and supplications of the glorious Theotokos and of all your saints. For you are a sanctification, and to you we ascribe glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. My hope is the Father, my refuge, the Son, my protection, and the Holy Spirit. Holy Trinity, glory to you. I place on my hope in you, Mother of God, keep me under your protection. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome everyone. We're, we've reached part four of our study of the Divine Liturgy. Today we're going to discuss the scripture readings. We left off, uh, we'll go a little more deeply, but we left off with the, uh, the Trisagion hymn. And uh, so we're going to pick up right from where we left off and continue on our, our journey towards the kingdom. So let's review just briefly the things that we discussed last month. We talked about uh, the life of St. John Chrysostom. Last month we had the blessing to meet on the day of his feast day. And of course St. John is the author of the liturgy that we're studying. So we talked a little bit about his life, how he was a bishop of Constantinople. He was very beloved by his people. And he was a great teacher who's left us over 1,000 sermons that are still in existence today. So he's, uh, may he always continue to guide and intercede for us as we continue to study his work. We discussed the, the history and the symbolism of the small entrance. We talked about how this point used to be the beginning of the liturgy, and everyone would enter together into the church. We talked about how the small entrance is the announcement of Christ's presence and entrance into the service. And uh, we are called to attention and reverence, being in the presence of Christ the true God. During the small entrance, we also pray for the angels to come and be with us, to attend with us, to serve the liturgy with us, and we believe this to be a reality of the liturgy, that the angels are surrounding us constantly. We also talked about the Trisagion hymn, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. This hymn is the hymn of the angels. We looked at the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah being the great Old Testament prophet who saw God in the temple surrounded by angels and they were singing, Holy, 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 Lord Savaoth. And so we've taken this passage and expanded it to fit our doctrine. Holy God is God the Father, Holy Mighty, God the Son, Holy Immortal, the Holy Spirit. And so we talked about how the, the Trisagion hymn is the hymn of the angels, and now we are singing with the angels in the praise of God. So let's continue now. We've reached the point where the Trisagion hymn is complete, and it's time for the scripture readings. Again, remember, in the old church, the... Everyone would have entered at the same time at the small entrance, and the scripture readings would have been the first thing that took place in the service. Because of the, the way the liturgy changed over time, it takes place now at this junction of the service, which is kind of the end point of the liturgy of the word, which I'll get into a little bit more later. 
So after the conclusion of the Trisayag, you know, the deacon or the priest, if there is no deacon, he turns to the people and says, let us be attentive. A lot of times maybe we take this as our cue that we can sit down to hear the epistle. But let us be attentive is actually a really important exclamation on the part of the, of the clergy. The priest or the deacon is telling us something very important is about to happen. First, the apostles, and then Christ himself will be coming to speak with us. They'll be standing in front of us and teaching us just as they did thousands, hundreds and thousands of years ago. So, as such, being in such a... a a miraculous event, such a life-giving event, we should be paying attention. We should be standing and paying attention during the readings. This, of course, was not a new problem uh, to have people pay attention, which is why it was introduced in the liturgy of all these years ago. It wouldn't be in there if it wasn't a necessary thing. St. John Chrysostom himself writes in one of his sermons, he says, let us attend, let us attend, and no one attends. Perhaps maybe sometimes we feel these are my words now. Perhaps sometimes we feel like, ah, I've heard of this gospel reading before. I've heard this epistle reading before. It's too hard. Maybe it's too hard for me to understand. It's very complicated. It's a very dense passage. So I'm not really going to pay attention. I'm going to take a little mental break now during the readings. I feel like this is sometimes a temptation that we have. Well, if that is your temptation, St. John's got more words for you. He says, how dare you? How dare you say that whatever it is they read is always the same? For you know neither the names of the prophets, nor the names of the apostles, nor the names of the evangelists. So he's saying, if you, th you are so smart, you think you've heard this one before, so you know everything. You don't know the first thing about the Bible. You need this. You need to pay attention because we don't have uh, the depth of knowledge of what's really in the scriptures. And when you read St. John's commentaries, you see that his understanding of the scriptures is on a totally different level from our own. It's, uh, he sees it through a different eyes. He says... Then again, how do you dare to say that you cannot understand the sacred texts or readings during the divine liturgy when you do not study them at home at all? So he says, you can't say, well, I'm not going to pay attention because I don't understand it, when you're not putting in any work to understand the texts. He goes on to explain that it's like when children complain that their parents tell them the same lessons over and over again. So he says... Uh, and, then the, and the children hearing the same lesson don't pay attention to the words of the parents. They just blow the parents off. So he says, don't you think that is insulting to you if your children, if they answer you in this way? And he says, it is. He says, likewise, you are an insult to Christ and the church for having the same attitude. So St. John is very uh, stern when it comes to this topic. The bottom line is that scripture readings are not a time to take a break or go use the bathroom or something like that. There are time to listen and receive this spiritual food that our soul needs. The words we hear are not empty but filled with the wisdom of God himself. So let's be attentive. Let's pay attention as the priest tells us or the deacon tells us. After the deacon calls us to attention, the reader chants the prokimenon of the epistle. This is the short verse that takes place right before the announcement of where the reading comes from. Uh, sometimes, for example, it's, their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words into the end of the earth. And then he'll say the reading is from St. Paul's letter to the, the Colossians or whoever it may be. Uh, so the Prokimenon is that first verse. The Prokimenon is a part of the Psalms. They come from the Psalms. And this is uh, up to the ancient, in the ancient church up until the 8th century, there used to also be an Old Testament reading before the Epistle reading. And in between the two readings, Old Testament and Epistle, there would be a psalm that would be chanted. So they would chant a whole psalm, and then they would chant the prokimenon at the end. Now all that's left is the prokimenon. We don't chant the psalm anymore. So this has been, since the 8th century, the way that we... Um, it's been moving towards the way that we have it now. After the prokimenon, the deacon says, Wisdom. This may also seem like an innocuous statement. Wisdom. What does that mean? It's not even a sentence, right? Just wisdom. Just saying wisdom. This, although, is an announcement that what we are about to hear in the readings is from the divine wisdom of God. Father Lawrence Farley, who is a, a priest, he is actually a convert from the evangelical church, I believe. But he's an orthodox priest. And he wrote a book, it's called Let Us Attend, A Journey Through the Divine Liturgy. And he, in this book, he says, not to overlook the significance of this exclamation of wisdom. 
He says, in a world filled with folly, overflowing with lies and distortions and half-truths, where can we find true wisdom? The deacon announces the presence of wisdom that all may pay attention to it. All too many places today, all too many today place no value on wisdom. They prefer pleasure or convenience. They prefer to have their ears tickled and to hear only what they want to hear. But in the church, true and saving wisdom is available, free to all with hungry hearts and humility to hear. And I myself echo these same exact sentiments. Our world, I'll take it even a step further, I would say our world does not only devalue wisdom, it has attempted uh, systematically to destroy wisdom and truth uh, altogether. Uh, they do this through the modern day heresy called pluralism. Pluralism is the idea that multiple truths, even if they're contradictory, can coexist with one another. This is the famous, well, you believe what you want to believe, and I'll believe what I want to believe, and we'll both be right, theory. What this does, though, what pluralism does, is it places truth within ourselves. It places truth in our own minds and makes it subjective. So, therefore, many contradicting ideas can be true at the same time. If, for those of you that were in the chapel for my sermon, I talked about people trying to convince us the sky was green. In pluralism, the sky can be green if you want it to be. In reality, though, this makes a world where nothing is really true, and it makes ourselves, ourselves the judge between true and false. In essence, it makes ourselves into God, and we, it leads us into total chaos. Thank God that in the church we are led back to the source of truth and life, who is Christ and the one true God, who is revealed to us in the scripture readings especially. So after the deacon says wisdom, the reader announces where the scripture reading is taken from. And then the priest or deacon again says, let us be attentive. It's like our final warning, like, okay, we're starting now, pay attention. The epistle readings come from a few places in the New Testament. The Acts of the Apostles, which is written by Luke. This is re read after uh, Pascha. The letters of St. Paul, uh, St. Peter, St. John the Theologian, St. James, or the book of Jude. Most of the year is dedicated to St. Paul because he wrote most of the New Testament. Uh, out of the 27 books of the New Testament, he's the author of 13 of them. So it takes a long time to get through his letters uh, throughout the lectionary because we only read a portion of them at, the t at, the, at a, one Sunday. So these books, though, that we call them books, but they were originally letters that these saints wrote to the different churches after the founding of Christianity. So when we say St. Paul's letter to the Romans, this was St. Paul writing a letter to the church in Rome that he had founded. And he's teaching them and helping them through the difficulties that they're experiencing as a, the new Christian church. So the temptation may be to say, well, these are historical documents. These were written for people that lived 2,000 years ago. But when we hear these words, we can't listen to it that way. We have to listen as if St. Paul is speaking to us living today. And you'll be very surprised to see that the problems the church has faced way back when are not very different from the problems that we face today and what our needs are. So, it's very, so this is why we place the apostles in such a place of honor in our divine liturgy and read them every uh, liturgy that we do. Even though the epistle readings don't come from the gospel books, gospel, of course, meaning the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, they have the same message. They're basically an extension of the gospel. Christ, after his resurrection, of course, sends out the apostles, and he says, go, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This was in the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. We read that quote. So what we have then in the epistle book is the apostles' message. It's the first message of the good news taken by the apostles into the new Christian world. That Jesus Christ, as God and man, has rescued mankind from death and offered us eternal life. So again, this is why we place such a emphasis on the epistle readings. But they don't have the same place of prestige as the Gospels, which takes place later. It takes place right after the epistles. And we, in the liturgy, St. Nicholas Cavasilas explains that we move from the lower to the higher. Basically, we save the best for last. So the gospel is saved for last. So after the chanter or the reader reads the epistle, the priest blesses the reader, and then the chanters and the people all together sing Alleluia three times. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. 
Alleluia means praise God, or God is praised. And we chant it with joy and fullness of heart to announce the presence of the Lord among us, that he's going to come and speak to us. So in other words, as a church, we say, look, the Lord is here. He's going to speak to us. Praise God and all his wisdom. Really, the gospel reading is not the priest simply reading from a book that was written almost 2,000 years ago at this point. It's Christ himself coming to speak to us, his people. Father Anthony Cuneris, who I've referred to many times over our meetings together, he says that through the gospel book, Christ speaks to us in every liturgy. He speaks to us the very same words he spoke to his disciples. He enters into conversation with us. It is as if we were, he were here now. It is as if he were here now. In fact, he really is present when we hear his word read to us. Father Anthony goes on to explain why the gospel readings are so important for us in our lives. This is his quote. He says, I remember once a man stopping his car to park in a strange city. He looked and looked for the coin slot in the parking meter, back when coin parking meters existed. Now they're getting, becoming more and more rare. But he could not find the coin slot. So he was getting frustrated, and finally he asked somebody what, uh, where the coin slot was on the meter. And the man that he asked said, try reading the directions on the meter. And of course, when he read the directions, he found where the coin slot was immediately. Father Anthony says, we too have questions about life. We fumble about not knowing who we are or where we are going or why we are here. All the while, the Lord Jesus is trying to tell us, why don't you try reading my directions for life in this book? Here is where I tell you what life is all about. In the same way that it's easier to operate new technology or new gadgets when we get them in our house, if we read the instruction manual, even though I know I myself am guilty of not doing that, it's way easier to live our life here on earth if we read the Bible and especially the Holy Gospels. They are, in, in a sense, the instruction manuals for life. Father Lawrence, who I mentioned earlier, he explains that hearing Christ's words places a responsibility on us as his followers. It is like receiving a great treasure into our hands. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to him whom has, excuse me, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So we can't be like the servant in the parable of the talents who gets his treasure from the, his master and buries it in the ground. If we receive the treasure of the gospel, we have to be ready to accept it into our hearts and allow it to grow and bear fruit within us, to transform us and to heal us. In order to prepare us for the gospel reading and to receive the gospel, the priest reads the prayer of the gospel, which I believe you should have in your packets. He said, the, the prayer is, Illumine our hearts, O Master, who loves mankind, with the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of your gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that, trample, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing all those things that are well-pleasing to you. For you are the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to you we ascribe glory, together with your beginningless Father, your all holy good and life-giving spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. So this prayer is read before every gospel reading in the liturgy that we do. What is this prayer saying? In the prayer we read, we pray first that God will enlighten us to understand the gospel readings. Many times we hear passages that are difficult to understand or digest. And this is very common, so very natural, because we, of course, our, our understanding is limited. And the wisdom of the Gospels is very much beyond us without God's help. We might wonder, what is going on in this reading? What does, what does this mean? So we pray to God to help us understand His life-giving words. If we are still unable, there are many, many books written about the Scriptures that explain what they mean. These are written, of course, by the Fathers. I said St. John Chrysostom left us over a thousand sermons. The bulk of those are scriptural commentaries where he's explaining what the scriptures mean. So if you ever have questions about what things mean, you can do a little research. Of course, the priests are here to help you as much as we can. But um, it's always good to do our own research because it helps us to remember things better as well. Also in this prayer, we ask that the gospel reading transforms us from people living for earthly pleasures into spiritual people 
living in a way that is pleasing to God. This is the purpose of the church. This is why we come to church. This is why we come to liturgy. And, and this is the purpose of the spiritual life itself. Transformation. Being transformed. Being transfigured back into the people that God made us to be. Now facing the people, the priest says, Wisdom arise, let us listen to the Holy Gospel. We hear that word wisdom again, which we discussed. And we also hear the priest tell us to arise. He says, stand up. This is a direct order, so to speak. Even though the church, of course, allows people to sit at different times in the liturgy and even during the epistle reading, when the gospel is read, when Christ is standing among us and teaching us, there's only one correct posture of worship, which is standing. Unless, of course, there is a physical disability or some reason why you would not be able to stand. The priest then blesses the people by saying, Peace be with you all. If we are familiar with the scriptures, this is of course the same blessing that Christ gives the disciples when he reveals himself to them for the first time after his resurrection. So the disciples, of course, after the crucifixion are in hiding. They're terrified of the Jews that they're going to get killed like Christ. And Christ appears among them on Pascha Sunday, the, the first Pascha, and he says, Peace be with you all. Now we, Christian followers, receive that same blessing from the priest as we prepare to receive that very same good news that the disciples did. It's almost like we're in the upper room again with the disciples, meeting Christ for the first time after his resurrection. This is our final preparation, so to speak, for hearing the gospel, because that way with peaceful hearts, with hearts that have peace, we may receive that gospel in our lives and bear fruit. Then, of course, the priest reads the gospel for the day. The gospel readings come from one of four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The church, however, sees these four books as one authentic testament, one authentic witness of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. So it's not, they don't, the different gospel books don't compete with each other. They're all the same voice, so to speak. It's all the evangelists speaking together, proclaiming the truth of the risen Christ. So just as with the epistles, we cannot listen to the gospel readings as an account of historical events. They're not history books. Rather, they are the very presence of God among us. The God who through his teachings takes us to the kingdom of heaven. For this reason, St. John, the theologian, not the Christostom, St. John at the conclusion of his gospel says, These things are written, meaning these gospel books are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in him... That, and that believing you might have life through his name. So the purpose of the Gospels is eternal life. That when we read them and take them into our hearts, eternal life will blossom out of our souls. We have to be careful, though, to note that understanding and receiving the Gospel is not, as Father Lawrence explains, an intellectual exercise, but a spiritual operation. So understanding the Gospel has nothing to do with your mental capacity. It has nothing to do with your intellect. It has nothing to do with how smart you are. It said, he says, it requires not so much a keen mind as an open and humble heart. I'll share one quick story that will hopefully make this point clear. It comes from Father Stephanos Anagnostopoulos, who wrote a nice book called Experiences of the D Divine Liturgy. And he says that when he was a deacon in 1960 in Thessaloniki, Greece, he went to a religious bookstore to buy a book. In Greece, there are many Orthodox bookstores everywhere you walk. You'll find one eventually, which is very nice. He met in the store a priest named Father Leonidas, who used to be a preacher in that area. So Father Stefano says that two minutes had not gone by, as the two priests were talking, when a granny, that's the word he uses, when a granny who was about 75 years of age entered the bookstore. She said good morning, asked for Father Leonidas' blessing, and asked the shopkeeper for a holy Bible. And then Father Leonidas began speaking to this woman. He says, do you know how to read? Remember, 1960 in Greece, education was, we were just coming out of the Civil War. Education was not a priority, especially for the older generation. It was not an opportunity. So the, gran the granny says, oh, no, I don't know how to read. So Father Leonidas, are you buying this book as a gift for your children or for a grandchild of yours? She says, no, I'm buying it for myself. Father Leonidas responds, Well then, what are you going to do with it? For you don't know how to read. Are you just going to put it by your icons in your icon stand? And then the granny explained, You see, Father, I will take it in the morning and at night. 
I will be standing before the icon of Christ with the vigil lamp, lamp lit, the oil lamp. Many Greeks in their homes keep oil lamps in their house. So she lights the oil lamp and she opens, she says, I will open the book from the beginning and pr start praying to Christ, saying, My Christ, I don't know how to read. However, whatever is written here on this page, may you put it first in my heart, she points to her heart, and then in my mind. And illuminate me so that I may say whatever you have written in here, first to my children and grandchildren, and then to those who thirst for your word. Now, Father Stephanos explains that he and Father Leonidas remained speechless for a long time because they were completely astonished. Later, Father Leonidas blessed that holy person and offered her a big book of the New Testament. So even though this woman had no education, not even to read the book itself, she was able to receive the gospel in her heart and in her mind because of her humility and because of her love for God. So we can't think that because we are educated and that we can read that we know everything. That prayer and humility take precedence in the church over our education. So after the conclusion of the gospel, the priest returns, he blesses the people with the gospel book and returns it to the altar table and he comes out to preach the sermon. Even though in many churches today the sermon is not preached at this time, like Panagias, we preach at the end, the end of the liturgy, the proper place for the sermon in the liturgy is right after the gospel reading is completed. The reason for this is that the sermon is supposed to be an interpretation or an explanation of the reading of the day. So it makes sense that, uh, as such, the sermon would follow immediately after the gospel so that the message could be fresh in our minds, so that the priest uh, doesn't have to remind you, basically reread the story for you again at the end of the service. So preaching is a great responsibility for the priest. As I said earlier, hearing the gospel is a very big responsibility on all of us. Taking that message, taking that treasure, and explaining it and teaching it uh, is according to the, the truth and according to orthodoxy, is even a greater responsibility, the fathers say. Because if the shepherd is teaching the wrong thing, if the shepherd is on the wrong road, then the sheep will be too. And then the shepherd is going to be responsible for losing all the sheep. So you should always pray in your prayers for your priests that in their preaching uh, we can proclaim the truth and proclaim the true gospel and not something false. The sermon is not, however, as I said about the readings earlier, a time to check your emails and chit-chat with your neighbor. I read this story from the life of St. John the Merciful, who was Archbishop of Alexandria in the 7th century. It says, at that time, the story goes, at that time, certain Christians who were not very devout were in the bad habit of stepping out of church during the preaching, immediately after the reading of the gospel, in the divine liturgy, so that they could go and start chatting with each other. So imagine now, not only that a priest is preaching, but that the patriarch of Alexandria, whose title, whose official title in the church is the judge of the world, uh, he uh, is pre going up to preach and people are leaving the church to chit-chat in the narthex. Imagine the boldness that they had. So these people would once again re-enter the church once the cherubic hymn would start. So basically once the sermon was over. So they weren't interested in, hearing the, in the, the, hearing the sermon. So it says, Since the situation seemed irredeemable, St. John, at one point in a liturgy, stepped out of the altar, completely vested in his hierarchical vestments, walked out through the aisle of the church, and went out into the narthex and sat down with them. And it, they, it says that as soon as they saw him, you can imagine they were astonished. The saint told them, Don't be surprised. The shepherd has to be where the sheep are. We will either all enter the church together, or I will also stay with you outside, and I will preach the word to you right out here. So in this way, he managed to correct this very bad habit that they had been forming in his church. So during the sermon, when your, your priests are preaching here at Panagias, don't take a mental break, don't start chatting, because we're going to have to come and sit with you and preach to you in the pews and in the narthex as well. Okay. Now, with the conclusion of the sermon, once the sermon is done, if it's done at this point in the service, or the gospel, if, it's, if the sermon is preached at the end, we've come to the end of the first major portion of the liturgy. If you remember our first class this September, I talked about how the liturgy was two parts. 
The first part, the liturgy of the word, which was focusing on the teaching and the scripture. And the second part, the liturgy of the faithful, which is the focus is Holy Communion and receiving the, the body and blood of Christ. So up until this part, this first four meetings that we've had, we've only been working in the first section, the liturgy of the word. The part where we hear God's words and we receive his enlightenment. St. Nicholas Cavasilas remarks that the readings prepare us and cleanse us in readiness for the great sanctification of the holy mysteries. So the reason why we do the readings first is because they prepare us for the reception of the sacraments. If we read uh, in the gospel, there's this, the story of the two disciples walking to Emmaus after the resurrection. They had not heard about the resurrection. They had no inclination of what had happened. And Christ meets them on the road, but they don't know it's him. And he explains to them the scriptures. He explains to them the prophets. He said, they say, they, he, the gospel says that he opened their eyes to the scriptures. And when they finally reach Emmaus, they all have um, the meal together and Christ breaks the bread and then they realize that it's him. They realize that they were with Christ this whole time. In the same way in our liturgy, we first hear the gospels explained to us. We first hear the gospels and the scriptures explained and preached to us the way that Christ preached to them. And then we have the meal, the agape meal, which is Holy Communion. And we are unified with him. So now that we've been prepared, we've been cleansed through the readings, we have attained our preparation and we're ready to move forward. One last thing, if I can keep your attention. I know the kids are cute, but let me keep your attention. In many of our modern churches, the liturgy would move directly into the great entrance, such as Panagias. We, after the gospel, we go right into the great entrance. In former times, however, and in some churches you'll find here and there, there are first petitions that are, are read and chanted by the priest. And these have to do with the catechumens. The catechumens, of course, being those who are studying to enter into the faith. And at the end of these petitions, the catechumens are asked to leave the church. It says, the catechumens depart, all catechumens depart. Now, the catechumens at this time were not allowed to stay in the church because, as I said, the second half of the liturgy is the liturgy of the faithful. It has to do with the sacrament, receiving the body and blood of Christ, which, of course, is reserved for those who are baptized Orthodox Christians. So this is one more thing to show us that we're moving now. We're moving from this first part, the word, the scripture, into the second part, which is the body and blood of Christ, the sacrament of Holy Communion. Are there any quick questions? I know we're running out of time. We have two minutes. If anybody has any questions about the scripture readings, about, yes. So the question was, why do some churches do the homily right after the gospel and other churches do the homily at the end? Also, some churches I've seen do it uh, at, right as the priests are preparing Holy Communion. If there's more than one priest, they'll do the homily then. The reason is completely practical. Unfortunately, uh, in our modern day church, and I will say unfortunately, people have a tendency of arriving to church very late. Some people will even come right before Holy Communion. And as a priest, I have to say, I don't know if you, you are perpetrators of this, but it's wrong. Uh, the liturgy starts with, blessed is the kingdom. You know, here at Panagias, upstairs, they start at 10, we start at 9.45. That's when we should be here. To be a little bit late, okay, economia. We have forgiveness in our church. There's mercy in our church, too. Uh, but it was becoming a, such a problem where the homily, imagine if I came out to give the homily after the gospel, there would be probably only about a third or a half of the people that would be there at the end of the church service. So practically speaking, the priest's message, the message of the gospel can be proclaimed to more people, practically, if it's done at the end, which is why it's done that way. The downside is you don't have that continuation of hearing the gospel and hearing the explanation right away. You kind of have to get out of the mode of the liturgy of the faithful and go back into the liturgy of the word, uh, which can be difficult sometimes. You know. There's a lot of time that takes place in between, a lot of things that happen in between the gospel and the sermon at the end, so it might forget the gospel passages and all its nuances. So that's the reason why. Are there any other quick questions before I let you go vote in the parish council elections? No? Okay, with that, God bless all of us. St. John of the Maskinos and St. Barbara, may they intercede for us and guide us always. God bless you and all your families.
Oh, mi tranquilizar. 